Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome back to another session with Dr. Eiler for an update on today's economy. As always, use the chat feature to pose any questions for Dr. Eiler, and he will address them at the end of the session. Thank you, Dr. Eiler. Thanks, Vicki, and thanks, folks, for coming. Uh, we'll probably have some more folks jump on here in a minute. But I want to thank you for taking the time. I want to thank Chabin and Kaiser Marston for continuing to support uh, these seminars and try to inform you all about what's going on. So I usually start with a look at the national economy in terms of the labor market. One of the things we're going to come back to in a little while is the forecast for potential economic slowdown and recession in 2023. One of the reasons why we have not had a declared recession to date uh, is that we have uh, not had the, in a sense, the, um, the combination of a jobs market slowdown and an economic productivity slowdown at the same time. So what we are looking for is we're looking for that contraction in the labor market in such a way to say, okay, now that corroborates the slowdown in productivity and in such a way, we now are in recession. The American economy in the Great Recession moved like this. So if we start the Great Recession in November 2007, and we think about the total number of people employed in the United States, it took 78 months to get back to that same aggregate number. In the most recent recession, which is around the pandemic and its most recent recovery, we have now gone above and beyond the total number of people that were working in January 2020 seasonally adjusted. And that's where 100 starts for the black line. We're now at 100.8% of that number. So the recovery of the labor market in the American economy is keeping us from declaring a recession took place in 2022, even though, as we'll see later, the first two quarters of 2022 saw a contraction in real income growth, which is what we think of as GDP after inflation. Uh, that growth is how we usually signify technical recession when there's two quarters in a row that are negative, but the labor market continuing to slowly grow is keeping us from declaring that outcome as of yet. But we'll come back to this when we talk about the forecast in just a second. Inflation remains a key issue for policymakers and also for anybody who's a consumer or a business in the American economy. And this is true for most of the emerged world. These price data specifically are what we call core personal consumption expenditures prices or the cost of a shopping basket of goods after food and energy prices have been pulled out. That's what makes that shopping basket core but everything else we buy in the American economy as consumers goes in that shopping basket. What September 5.1% means is that if you look back to September 2021, the cost of that shopping basket by September 2022, one year later, cost 5.1% more. So that is relatively high historically. You can see these data are monthly from 2007 to September 2022. And most of that period, and in fact, most of the period going back into about the mid to early 2000s, we're basically somewhere under 2.5% inflation per year in, in the 2010s was actually under that blue dotted line, which is the goal of the Federal Reserve when it's trying to shape inflation expectations, uh, was under that number, which is great. I mean, we really saw the 2010s, this sort of very positive exploratory time in how we shape inflation expectations but as you can see, that spike in those data after that very skinny shaded line, which is the pandemic recession, that spike has been a problem and remains so. So the recent high increase in, in, sorry, in interest rates means to move that blue solid line through those red dots, even though the error possibilities are the bands around those red dots. That shaded area shows you the forecast that is now is currently running around the Federal Reserve as to where that solid blue line is going over the next few years. So the supposition is, is we're still going to have relatively high inflation probably through the end of 2024, but it's going to be subsiding quickly in 2023. So the key is whether or not the increase in interest rates and sort of the assumed shaping or reshaping of behavior by consumers and businesses actually moves us through that path or not. But what we should be watching initially, for example, is in our holiday season right now, will price competition help more quickly move those prices down. So you may have been inundated over the last weekend with emails and advertising about sales going on, why you should buy now, um, that prices are going down and there's, there's sales all over the place. Part of that is because businesses know that if you're stretched a little bit at home because of inflation, if you're going to continue to spend, you're going to need a price incentive to do so. 
The good thing about that is it should lead to a maybe a more quick movement downward, especially if inventories remain relatively high because of a weak holiday season going into 2023. The problem with that is it then foreshadows the idea that we're going to see some people lose their jobs, and we're already hearing that. So that nasty trade-off between inflation control and a kick up of the unemployment rate is this sort of classic balancing act that policymakers and economists worldwide are watching. Interest rates are, have gone up relatively significantly in 2022. And in fact, as significantly as we've seen in maybe the last 30 years in terms of Federal Reserve policy, how much higher are they going to go? We're going to address that in just a second. But one of the other things that financial markets are watching is that if these price data do not start moving through those red dots, will we see interest rates go even higher? And what that means is we should start to see housing prices and employment levels start to change, unfortunately, in the wrong direction. So we've already seen housing prices flatten a little bit. We'll talk more about that in a minute, too. And we're watching closely at the local level about whether or not our job markets are starting to react to relatively high prices, relatively high interest rates, and not having enough of a trade-off to where now I'm looking as a business and saying, I need to stop growing, or I don't plan to grow anymore, which means I have to start contracting either the number of jobs I'm looking for or the number of workers I currently have. And we should expect that as a reaction to higher interest rates and remaining lingering high inflation, both those variables are going to start to decline in 2023. And that's what's going to push us a little closer to maybe declaring recession in 2023, but I'll get back to that in just a second also. This is a kind of a fun graph in the sense that this is a straw poll taken at the Federal Reserve by its so-called Federal Open Market Committee about the interest rates that the Federal Reserve sets. So that committee the one that decides on interest rates, and in a couple of weeks, we're probably going to hear the interest rates went up one more time in 2022, shows this straw poll for the next few years. So those blue dots are the individual opinions, but not assigned to any one person of the Federal Reserve's Open Market Committee about where things are going to be in 2022, starting from left to right, then 2023, 2024, and then the so-called longer run, which nobody really knows what that means. Even economists really don't know what that means. Only the internal workings of the Federal Reserve kind of has an idea what date that is. But the more important idea is, is the shaping of those opinions. So about one year ago, these data are from September 2022. And in January, the, the latest data for quarter four will come out. But this was the trajectory in September 2021 of, A, where those dots were for 2022 and where things were going through 2024. So the supposition was, and this is the way we talk about interest rates as economists, is that you should have the slow, steady sort of step ladder up, and it'll get us home later in the sense that everybody is sort of predicting where things are going. It's a smooth path. Six months later, this was the dispersion of those blue dots in 2022, the box, and the green arrow showed the path of interest rates after that. So we knew we were going to see some lift off, and we'd already seen some by March 2022. But the trajectory of interest rates along that green arrow really didn't change that much from the opinion six months before. So interest rates had started to change. There was a lot of wild opinion about where we're going to go next by the end of this year. But by the September 22 meeting, things had consolidated at a higher level, and the path was basically the same. Now, if you look at the blue dots on this graph, the idea is that instead of going sort of back down smoothly over the next few years, we actually might kind of kick up a little bit higher in 2023 and then start to decline. So there's been a wild shift even over the last 12 or 15 months in the opinion about where interest rates should go. And where interest rates are right now, this should show, is right there in terms of the short-term interest rate that the Federal Reserve sets. So we started this year at the bottom of this graph at zero to 0.25%, 0 and we're already up there. And we should go into that cloud of blue dots for 2022 this month, or I'm sorry, in December, uh, when the Fed Reserve meets. The key is how much higher will they go? And in fact, if recession begins, will the Fed Reserve start to cut rates? And in a sense, the shape of those blue dots suggests that they're already foreseeing that the higher rates are going to create an economic slowdown for which they can then drop interest rates a little bit to re-stimulate the economy. They're already planning on that, especially if you look toward the so-called longer run. They don't intend to keep interest rates that high for that long. They intend to reshape them and get them down to something that's a little bit more intermediate path. But the interest rate history in the United States, especially over the last 15 years, has been a wild experiment in relatively low interest rates, if not very low interest rates, with the idea that we were really recovering from a major recession and we still hadn't quite crawled out of the shadow of that when the pandemic hit. This is the forecast for the next few years that came out in November this year. The Federal Reserve 
every quarter they interview 40 forecasters and this is why it's called the survey of professional forecasters there's 40 people that they interview that basically all of those folks do every day of the week is forecast what's going to go on with the american economy and the three variables they look at are real gdp growth of that income after inflation and the percentage growth of that on an annualized basis what's going to happen with the unemployment rate and then that so-called core pce inflation same thing as we saw with those red dots a couple of graphs ago so if you look at the growth over the last few quarters, we had two quarters of negative growth in 2022, uh, and that began the discussion of so-called technical recession, but the third quarter was actually positive and relatively strongly positive, which is good. And we're the, right now, as you're gonna see here, the estimate for the year end 2022, which is that shaded area, the numbers to its left that starts with 1.6 in that column is the previous quarter's forecast. The new quarter's forecast, or the one that we just uh, emerged from, the third quarter of 2022, has 1.9% growth uh, for 2022 overall. So picking up growth in the third quarter sort of provided the idea that we were actually going to have positive growth, even though we had negative growth the first two quarters, that the year end will actually be positive overall. But then notice the number down from that for 2023 is 0.7%, which is very slow growth. And if you look to its left, it was 1.3 one quarter ago. That is almost a half of, or one half of the original forecast one quarter ago, which means that economists that forecast the American economy are seeing a much slower, if not maybe even recession, 20, or recessionary 2023 at this point where the year is gonna be very slow, but we may have a recession within. They haven't said that explicitly yet, but when you have a relatively low number for growth, you have to assume that that's true. 20, 2024 and 2025 look like we're kind of getting back to pre-pandemic growth levels, somewhere around 2% per year. A lot of that's sort of a hedge, the idea that the interest rates are going to go back down a little bit. It's going to pick up the economy a little bit and in, in a sense sort of soften the blow from 2023. Unemployment, while rising a little bit, notice that now we're in the fours, which sounds just crazy to say that rising into the fours is actually a problem. Uh, over most of American history, if you had somewhere around the 4% level of unemployment, that is historically low and basically the target of policy in terms of creation of jobs. But that little liftoff from the recent lows we've seen in unemployment suggests that trade-off I talked about before. With relatively high interest rates, businesses are going to start slowing down, especially if consumers slow down their spending, and we got to expect some job loss there. Some of that increase in the unemployment rate is also the reemergence of a labor force that has not been engaged coming back in to the labor market. And then finally, those red dots showing their face, inflation slowing down over the next few years. The key is that growth is forecasted to slow down even more than it was already forecasted just one quarter ago in 2023. And unemployment is looking like it's going to kick up a little bit, but none of these suggest a sharp contraction being forecasted yet. It suggests a slower moving economy, perhaps slow enough to where we're going to declare a mild recession in 2023. But keep in your mind that the reason why we would declare a recession is because there are three major items happening at the same time. One, slower, if not negative, real GDP growth, rising unemployment slash smaller or lower levels of employment and we have lower levels of job openings meaning that not only are we losing jobs but businesses are also not seeking jobs and the, the sum of those parts all together kind of suggest a slower economy and one in which we may have to have policy react to pick us back up because we're now in true recession so watch for all three of those to move around in 2023 in such a way that it would creep us closer the key is what you see on the street if people, if you know people are slowing down their spending and housing markets, job markets, and in, in essence, we'll talk about in a minute, construction really start to contract, those are the signs you're looking for. Okay, let's look at California. Same picture we saw right off the top. Here's the Great Recession. It took 72 months for California to go from a November 2007 level of employment across the state back to that same level. This is why we call it the Great Recession. And this is the evolution in the pandemic and its recovery, California just crossed the 100 line or where we were seasonally adjusted in January 2020 or pre-pandemic as our pre-pandemic benchmark just crossed it last month. And now we're at 100.4%. So the, the California economy kind of lagged the national economy and is now catch, catching up classic form for the California economy in terms of recovery from recession. However, we want to dig a little bit deeper for California. So these data are through October 2022. They came out a couple of weeks ago. If we take 
January 2020 is a pre-pandemic benchmark and seasonally adjust the data. What I want to show you is the evolution of the job losses. This is April and May 2020, the contraction across almost every single industry sector. And then moving quickly through the end of 2020, the end of 2021, and the last three months of data in 2022. This is where we are as of, as of October, where you can see there's still some negative numbers here. And those negative numbers mean that we have not quite recovered to the pre-pandemic level of jobs in those industries. So notice manufacturing has not quite recovered, but construction has. Transportation, warehousing, utilities, the one that's in the middle there at 14.9% is, is a strength of recovery across the United States, but in California for sure, as we move more of our lives online, that really has burgeoned and it burgeoned early in, in the uh, recovery period after the pandemic. If you look at the far right though, those are the ones that are worrying economists more. Wholesale trade and manufacturing should bounce back more or less. But in leisure and hospitality jobs, bars, restaurants, hotels, event centers, we're concerned that there may be a shifting business model where we're not going to have as many jobs, let's say by the middle of this decade, as we had before the pandemic. And that suggests a business model change away from as many workers. And that means that the normal job opportunities that would be in those industries, especially for our recent high school graduates, our college students, or people of any age that are of working age that are looking to make a career transition and just need an income, those things may not be there. Other services or other personal services, hair salons, nail salons, fitness centers, and a bunch of the things we don't necessarily categorize in the other industry sectors, also down about the same, about six and a half percent. Even government's down, but most of that's due to education being in a, a, or, uh, being a smaller level of jobs. So those industry sectors are really the focus of most economists watching the California economy. We really need to get those picked up, and if they're not picked up soon, it suggests a business model change that might lead to larger social issues later, especially for lower to middle income workers or for folk or for areas that are relatively uh, or have a relative risk in terms of tourism and in, in the sense of visitors really driving their local economy. Housing is going to be a big discussion point next year. However, we need to have some perspective. This is the last 12 month, months of price growth looking back from October 2022 to October 2021. So this is one year. And things have slowed down a little bit. And you can see that where these numbers are relatively close to zero now, uh, as I'm going to show you in a minute, the two-year run is a whole different ballgame. Places like Humboldt County, even Glen and Lassen in Northern California, Fresno and Kern, Santa Barbara County, Tulare, all those have actually shown pretty good resilience in terms of being somewhere above 10% growth over the last 12 months. This is the last 24. So it really kind of gives a perspective that even if we have a contraction of 20% housing prices, and I'm not saying that's going to happen, but I'll talk about the forecast in just a second. Having 44 or 45% growth to your median home price in your area means that you have some room to contract a little bit. And what should we really have expected from housing markets in the first place as we entered the pandemic? So all the stew that we have for rising home prices kind of really boiled together well in 2020, even with all the labor market problems we had, and people really took advantage of low interest rates, uh, the ability to move out of our urban areas into suburban and rural areas to work and work remotely. And that really pumped up a lot of markets across California. And then, of course, whatever units were left in the wake, given the uh, lower interest rates and immediately lower prices that then were sucked up by demand, our urban areas started to see some catch up there. But notice San Francisco is one of the smallest ones, about the middle where that negative 2% is. The 24 months is not much more above 6% for San Francisco. And San Francisco is kind of the poster child for the fleeing of population based on the ability to work remotely. And then we will see as the city comes back over the next few years or not, what happens in that housing market. However, regardless of the housing market forecast, we need to have some perspective that we've had amazing growth over the last 24 months and really over the last 36 in such a way that if we contract the compounded growth over the last three or four years after 2023 is over is still going to be pretty good for historic real estate gains. Now, the forecast is fading, so, but it's fading relatively slowly. So Zillow does a forecast every month for the next 12 months, and this is what that forecast looks like for right now. Del Norte County is about 2% up, about 1.8%, but California is down about just under 1%. Counties in the Bay Area and in, let's say, the North Bay, thinking north of the Golden Gate Bridge, 
And in North Central California, so Tehama County for right now just happens to be at negative 4.4%. Don't get too locked into being the last one or the highest one. The idea is that the trend across the state is starting to fade to where more counties have negative housing forecast in terms of median growth. But the whole point here is the, is the following. This slow moving cycle of seeing forecasts going into the negative really should be happening because interest rates have increased very quickly and the economy is starting to have more risk in it. So we should expect that housing prices are gonna to start to flatten a little bit, if not contract a little bit as a reaction to all those forces moving around simultaneously. The key is how low does it go and what broader housing market problems does that unveil? For example, does that lead to construction employment contracting by five or 6%? Does it lead to a bunch of people panicking and putting their housing up for sale and then looking for rental? And with rental, with rent prices relatively high, it sort of pushes that away and balance sheets of households are strong enough right now in such a way we should not expect people are doing, let's say, strategic default or walking away from housing because they're walking away from their loans like we saw in 2006 and nine. The credit market, housing market, and general economic conditions are just simply better in some than they were in 2006 to, that you should not be expecting to have a, another or let's say a repeat of the so-called Great Recession in housing. However, should we expect 10 or 15% reduction in home prices vis-a-vis -vis where we were in 2022? And the answer is, yeah, that's actually probably not a bad prediction. But if you look at the, if you remember the graph we just looked at, if in your area, median home prices increased over the last two years by 40%, a 10 to 15% decline in 2023 is not that big a deal. The key is whether or not we go down 30 or 40% over the next few years. And there's no reason to expect that yet. That, that would come on the, on the heels probably of a relatively strong economic contraction. So we're not expecting that either. You shouldn't worry too much about housing right now, but it is something we're watching closely because of the broad impact it can have if people start to panic as a result of these prices falling. I'm gonna show you two graphs to wrap up that are about job openings. So one of the things that economists have also been watching in the labor market is the evolution of job openings. And we've seen a real spike after the pandemic. So these data are monthly from January 2012 to September, 2022. And job openings as a percentage of total employment plus job openings, it's almost like looking at the unemployment rate in reverse, have been slowly rising over the 2010s and then fell sharply, as you can see that little spike down about two thirds of three quarters of the way moving left to right on this graph. And then we were on this wild rocket ship up in terms of the number of jobs being sought after by businesses into the beginning of this year. And that has started to soften. So that is the US graph. And here's California, which is basically following right alongside of it. So the idea with job openings is that job openings tend to rise during economic growth periods and tend to fall and maybe even are somewhat, a, are somewhat prescient of a recession when they fall as we go into recession. So that's we got, got a few people nervous about the job openings piece. But again, just like kind of housing prices, we had this historic spike up as we came out of the recession, similar to housing prices, and falling back might be more of what we call mean reversion or kind of coming back to the trend we would have been on anyway, than it is a, let's say, a total gutting of the labor market. However, there's an idea in economics called the beverage curve that suggests as job openings start to fade, we should expect unemployment to go up. And if you remember what we saw in the slide, maybe six slides ago, the forecast showing a fade or showing a slight increase in the unemployment rate is somewhat predicated upon that decline in job openings. Now, if we look across California, and you can see that decline there, if you pick your favorite metropolitan statistical area, the, these data come through EDD by so-called MSA. If you pick your favorite one, this is the percentage change in online job openings. So not general job openings, though most of them now find themselves online, but the ones that are explicitly online advertised. And you can see that across most of the areas in California, we're seeing declining online job openings where Modesto, Redding, Visalia, Stockton, Vallejo, or let's say Solano County, Fresno County are among the ones that have seen the largest contraction. When that decline takes place, now we're going to start focusing on, does that mean jobs are going to start to decline in those areas more quickly? So seeing all these negative numbers suggest that it's basically following what we saw before, the slow decline, and in some cases it might look very quick decline, but this is just looking back one year. But it's something that we do have data on 
at the relatively local level and watching these data evolve alongside of watching job markets is going to be a key way of thinking about whether or not that so-called beverage curve idea is working locally. So watch that. But this also kind of suggests that our labor markets are going to start, pardon me, slowing down a little bit in terms of their growth. Okay, so thinking forward, the economic slowdown is happening. Recession may or may not happen. I'm kind of giving it a 50-50 chance in 2023. A lot of that really depends on what happens with the labor market more than anything else. If we really don't see jobs decline and unemployment really start to move up in earnest, we probably will not have a recession declared in 2023. We had a two-month recession declared in 2020 when we had amazing job losses. So it's going to take, a, a, again, a, a combination of a bunch of different factors to get recession technically declared in 2023, but the chances are rising slightly, and it's about 50-50 we'll actually have a declared one. Assume, though, that the economy is going to start to slow down, and it's going to almost be like walking through mud for most of 2023, just slow slog to kind of get through the time of relatively high interest rates and relatively high prices. We're going to have a federal focus on chips and how to get out of whatever dip we take. So we've got a lot of focus on trying to repatriate technology, trying to increase manufacturing in the United States, whether or not the so-called CHIPS Act really does that job or not, and whether or not parts of California can really be affected positively by that, we will see. California itself is looking for more energy resiliency, looking for more manufacturing where it can find it, trying to really double down on education and workforce development. Uh, Funding and investment, we will see how that goes over the next couple of years, especially if now we're expecting a budget deficit or let's say not a large surplus because they're going to have to figure out how to balance the budget in, in Sacramento. But at the end of the day, we may, will very unlikely have anything that even looks like a surplus, much less a burgeoning surplus in 2023. We'll see how that works in terms of true investment. So what am I watching? I'm watching for those housing price reductions and whether or not that starts to lead to a construction employment slowdown. For right now, we've heard a lot of chatter that we've had a lot of projects that have been delayed, whether or not those projects kind of provide a bridge over troubled water for construction firms over the next year or so is a big deal. We're also watching commercial vacancies in the sense that will retail office really now see a final stand in terms of maybe the delay that's happened because of a bunch of federal funding and maybe uh, some businesses sort of hanging on to see what happens in recovery. And now that may be ending. And then we're watching for people just plucked at random, our prices at the grocery store are going to start to slow down. And does that mean that wage growth is going to start to slow down? Because the one thing about wages growing is it's very unlikely wages are going to rewind themselves. So the cost of doing business from a labor standpoint may now be permanently advanced upward. And what does that mean generally for hiring, not now, but two or three years from now? And what that ultimately means for workforce development and the types of jobs we're training for is also a big deal looking forward. So I'm watching those three things primarily beyond sort of the macro factors we talked about already today. So folks, if you have any questions, this would be a great time. Vicki, I did not see anything in the chat yet, but if somebody wants to raise their hand and um, see if we can't uh, get you on here, let me see if I can uh, uh, get you going here. Marie, go ahead. The chat is actually disabled when you try to put oh. something in chat. Oh boy. <laughs> so I wanted okay. to let you know that. But also, I'd be interested. I noticed Siskiyou County, which is at the far north, and uh, Modoc County were not on your housing um, information. And I didn't know if we just didn't have enough in this far north or if you have those data. No, I have those data. Uh, they, they're also. Uh, in slight decline mode, I didn't. I didn't want to crowd that graph with every all 58 counties and California because it's kind of tough to see. Uh, but they're they're basically in the same mode as most of the other parts of Northern California in terms of relatively robust two years and a very slight declining forecast for 2023 thus far. Thank Does you. that help? Yep. Thanks. All right. Cool. Stephen. Good morning. Uh, quick question. You touched real briefly on the California economy moving forward uh, through 2025. Um, I just wanted to get a recap on that. Do you see the surplus going down and the economy taking a little bit of a dip overall? Yeah, we should expect that we're going to see slower job growth, if not loss in California, and then an elevation of the unemployment rate. And some of that will be a function of and also drive 
what's going to happen in Sacramento in terms of funding. So one of the things that was a little disturbing to me is that we didn't think about that coming when we had two years of unprecedented surplus that we could have been a little bit more maybe strategic, but there is a lot of money banked for what you could call investment. How, how that money rolls out and how that may or may not support a, a small dip in the California economy is unknown right now. There's still going to be some legislative wrangling on how that's going to take place, but we should expect the American or sorry, the California economy to basically mirror the American economy in the sense that we should expect 2023 to be a relatively tough year, uh, at least looking at 2021 and 2022 with that perspective, and that we're going to see some job loss. Uh, the, the key is how broad based that job loss is. If it basically looks like the tech industry and maybe it's environs in the Bay Area and maybe in LA and San Diego are really where most of the action is in job loss, it might, it might not spread its wings completely across California. But if we start to see construction and manufacturing jobs lost, that's where you kind of feel like, okay, we're having a little bit more general problem in the labor markets. That makes sense. Because I mean, California is a bust and boom economy, right? So we see surpluses when we see uh, housing prices going up and tech industry. So really, it's watching those starts and see what happens. Yeah. And, and then again, think of it this way, that we've already heard there's tech job losses. It, what we don't want is we don't want that to spread into services and construction and manufacturing, at least with the idea that if the economy is slowing down, how broad based are those jobs loss, job losses going to be? So if we can hold on to some of those, let's say, goods producing and more services producing outside of tech jobs, that'll help kind of buffer or kind of get us through the storm in 2023. Thank you. You're welcome. Daryl. Um, yes, was just checking to see if there's uh, any impact with all the military activity that's going on, because uh, California is very tech, he tech heavy and also um, kind of defense and uh, offensive uh, weaponry. And so just curious as to if that's factored into the input or is that something that uh, has not actually hit those industries yet? Because no, great question. Yeah, great question. So I think some of it is happening in tech in the sense that there's this uh, inability to gain some labor that used to be remote in Eastern Europe that's now otherwise engaged one way or the other. Uh, the loss of, of Russian labor and Ukrainian labor definitely has put a small pinch on the tech industry in terms of finding flexible labor outside the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, but our defense contractors, I think, have, have probably in kind of a you know, dubious but classic way uh, have done well through this. The ones I've talked to um, are preparing for more demand. Uh, and that, that's, you know, depending on your political and social and economic perspective, that can be either good or bad. Uh, right. But that's there's no doubt that that should support some jobs in California, um, perhaps for dubious reasons, depending on your perspective. Yeah, I'm just thinking because of the replenishment, you know, when you're using, you know, these exactly. are things that have been sitting in storage and now they're actually being used and moved around to, you know, to Europe. And so they're, therefore inventories need to be replaced. So it's, you know, it's looking at just the, the model of supply and demand. You got it. And, and, and they yeah. are. And the ones I've talked to are gearing up for both. They're gearing yeah. up for replacement and additional demand. Yeah, so it's not it's not a political thing. It's just looking at product moving. That's what I'm saying. Exactly. Depending yeah, on your yeah. perspective, you could just see it purely from an economic standpoint. It should support some jobs. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Bob. Hi, Dr. Eiler. I uh, a question about um, something that happened during the I guess you'd call it the COVID recession um, was a pretty rapid decline of the labor force. People leaving the job market. Um, how are you starting to see a return of people to to jobs, and how do you expect that to affect um, both the unemployment rate and the chart that you showed uh, with uh, new job openings uh, in a pretty rapid decline? Yeah, the great question. So we have started to see the labor force pick up a little bit, where it had sort of flatlined or was not quite crawling back up to its pre-pandemic levels. So the supposition is is that that liftoff has got to be people who weren't in the labor force before coming back into it, uh, which which is good in terms of maybe loosening up the labor market conditions in terms of how tight it's been and how hard it's been to find workers. What that might do is it might actually stem a little bit the decline in job openings with the idea that if I've been struggling to find workers and I've had these job openings open for 12, 15 months and I haven't found anybody and I think the economy is going to slow down, I'm going to start pulling those job openings out of the market. If I feel like now there's 
new workers that are coming in and I might have an easier time finding wor workers and furthermore, the increase in wages may not be as fast. I might keep those job openings there for another six months in the hopes that I actually will find somebody. The key is whether or not finding somebody actually has the revenue benefit of hiring that worker given where the economy is going. So what one concern is in terms of the labor market is you'll have these people reemerge because of relatively higher wages, a relatively tight job market, relatively high job openings. And then as they come in, the demand for their time will start to decline simultaneously in such a way we'll see a relatively quick pickup of the unemployment rate. So that's the game that's right now being played in terms of policymaking is can we provide the conditions under which those now reemergent workers are going to be able to find work by but also controlling for inflation with moving up interest rates. So that, that balancing act is something we have to expect, at least in the short term, like let's say for most of 2023, it's going to lead to a little bit higher unemployment rate, at least. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah, thank you. Of course. Let's see. Okay, we have one more question. Doug. Thanks, Dr. Eiler. I just uh, know the core inflation uh, excludes food and energy. But that's what affects all of us the most, as far as I'm concerned. So yeah. I'm wondering what the real inflation rate is that you see when you include that in the inflation rate. Yeah. So instead of 5.1, it's a little closer to seven uh, when you include those other pieces. And you're asking a much more deeper philosophical question, believe it or not. And here's the idea. The reason we exclude that historically is because there's so much volatility in commodities prices that both food and energy as sort of sectors of the economy tend to be very volatile in terms of how prices move. So you don't wanna make a policy decision based on a couple of months of rising food or energy prices that two or three months from now, because of some change in harvest or some change in the way that we're extracting oil from the ground, will move those prices back down again. However, the longer those prices remain elevated and linger at a relatively high level, they start to permeate a bunch of different supply chains. So that's why we've had such aggressive interest rate increases is that not only um, have we seen prices historically high, at least over the last 30 years, in, term, in terms of the percentage change, but we're also concerned that if we don't do something about it now, that lingering high inflation, uh, including food and energy prices at some point of how they permeated other supply chains, will now start to change inflation expectations. So you nailed it, though, if you bring that full circle person people plucked at random are not thinking about inflation expectations pce cpi the macroeconomic aspects of inflation and unemployment trade-offs and all that other craziness they're thinking how much more is milk how much more does it take to fill my car up with gas and how much more does it take to put food on the table table generally so they're going to be thinking about that when it remains elevated over time and that's the inflation expectations piece is if it's costing me more to just put food on the table does isn't that mean i'm shifting some of my budget which might be somewhat fixed to things other or to things that are more food and energy related and abandoning consumption of other things. And that's where you get this tipping toward recession is because this contraction now in consumption is more about food and energy because I need to buy that stuff and it's costing me more. So I'm going to abandon the purchase of other stuff and the economy starts to slow down. So you nailed it that it, at the end of the day, we don't talk about it because of the volatility, but in rare occasions, it lingers at a high enough level where we need to talk about it more. Thank you. You're welcome. Vicki, thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Eiler. And uh, as the says here on the screen, uh, later today, tomorrow, this uh, webinar and the slides will be available on the jabinconcepts.com. Uh, look forward to hearing from you again and for all of you attending in the next quarter, the first quarter of 2023. Thank you. Thanks, folks.